get an acid base in level three, correct? You don't get it. So this is kind of a review update from level two. The exemplar for this is mixed acid base disorders, all right? And y'all bear with me. I haven't lectured in, in six months, so I might be a little rusty. Y'all the first guinea pig, sorry. Mixed acid base disorders. And I'm going to try to make everything simplified. All that is is a patient with a chronic disease, say COPD. What kind of disturbance would a patient with COPD have? What kind of acidosis? Respiratory acidosis. Who comes to the emergency room with acute gastroenteritis. Does anybody know what acute gastroenteritis acid base disturbance would be? Metabolic alkalosis. Because you're losing stomach acid from vomiting. So you have a mixed disorder. You have respiratory issue and a GI issue. So the nurse is going to treat it, take into consideration both disturbances and treat both of them. So respiratory acidosis, COPD, how much O2 are you going to put the patient on? Very little. Okay, let's be more specific, but you're right. Um, Nasal cannula, what, two to five liters? Not oh, two to three, really. You don't want to put them on more than that. And then for the gastroenteritis, what are you going to give them for that? What? Pentoprazole? No, that's a PPI. I mean, that would be more preventative. It's not a wrong answer, but what would you do to take care of the acute problem? Zofran. Zofran. On Dancitron. Remember, when you're studying, study generics of the drugs. On Dancitron, four milligrams. All right, that's not working. They're still vomiting. Eight milligrams. That's not working. Still vomiting. Twelve milligrams. By this point, what are you going to do? They're still vomiting. You're giving them twelve milligrams of Dancitron. What are you going to do? Would you not do that again? Call the health care provider for an order for a different med. On dancing drum doesn't sleep, work on oh. any, everybody. Fluids is correct too, because they're losing volume. So yes, I, I see your train of thought. Uh, branch off a little bit and come up with those other. So you're on the right track. I'm not critiquing you, but I, I see what your thought processes are. You're doing fine. I'm sorry. I'm not meaning to. Exactly. Say <laughs> Stephanie's been an EMT for nine years. Right. So. Never mind. <laughs> You're doing fine. <laughs> anyway, um, you see where I'm going with this? What's the nurse going to do? You're going to get a set of gases, interpret it. What's the nurse going to do? And then mixed disorders is your exemplar. So we'll go over some scenarios with that. Um, uh, it's a two hour lecture. I probably have about eight questions on the test. Um, all right, so let's move forward. Okay, I'm not going to test on partial compensation, but the one thing I do wish you to remember is if the PaCO2 and the bicarb are abnormal, but the pH has returned to normal, it's fully compensated. That's all I need, want you to remember. We're not doing oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. That's for you critical care nurses. You can have it. When you go start doing critical care, there's going to be no questions on that. Base excess, Ms. Sean may go over that in metabolism. So I'm keep it simple for me. I just want you to straight up interpret the gas. What's the nurse going to do? All right? Matching. Y'all get your matching and get a pen if you don't have it printed. So what this exercise does is it connects acid-base disturbances with actual disease processes, all right? So I, it'll be a call and response, Socratic questioning, and then I'll amplify that. So first one, blood transfusions. What's that, um, what's that disorder? Metabolic what is it? Metabolic alkalosis. Metabolic alkalosis. Does anybody know why? Because of the citrate preservative 
that's used in blood products. Citrate is a buffer, so the patient will get alkalotic, all right? Plus, you give it a lot of volume. We're gonna go over um, blood transfusions in the fluid and electrolyte class, which I will be teaching as well, because I'm real familiar with hemorrhage and blood loss and all that working in surgery, all right? The next one, fear and anxiety. What type of metabolic, well, not metabolic, what type of acid-based disturbance would that be? Respiratory alkalosis. Why? Why is it respiratory alkalosis? You're breathing, you're breathing fast. fast, but what are you breathing off? Your CO2, all right? So your CO2 is going to drop, and you're going to have alkalosis, respiratory alkalosis. So what can you do? What would be the nursing intervention for this patient who's fearful, anxious? Decrease What's that? Decrease stimulation. Okay, that's a good one. Decrease stimulation. What else? Um, deep breath. Deep breath. Deep breath. Slow deep breaths. Maybe breathe into a bag, but maybe not. That helps retain CO2. What medication can you give them if they're anxious? Oh, yeah. Narcan? Did I hear you wrong? I swear, I'm sorry, I forgot my hearing aids. Valium, Adivan. What did you say? Adivan, which is, Diazepam. or Azepam, which is a benzodiazepine. Remember your farm? Mm -mm. So for patients who are novices, like a half a milligram, start there because Ativan will knock you on, off your socks. It, and it's kind of got a long half-life, so it lingers around. All right, so you see where I'm going with this exercise? Take, interpret it, then what's the nurse gonna do? All right, anesthetics. What is it? Respiratory acidosis, why? What do anesthetics do? Respiratory depression. And I, I'm looking at this anesthetics. Think of a patient who, for those of you going into cath lab or interventional radiology, think of a patient who is getting um, propofol for, for short IV conscious sedation. You're depressing the respiratory center so the buildup of CO2 happens. So what can you do for this patient? I'm sorry? Stop the, um, yes, stop the propofol. Bump up the O2. What else? If you have to stop the procedure, you can sit them up, help promote breathing. Sitting a patient up is like a quick thing you can do to help promote oxygenation. It takes the pressure off of the diaphragm and promotes lung expansion, all right? So respiratory depression, maybe give them a little more O2. Um, if it gets bad enough and they have, uh, they get obstructed, you might have to do a breathing treatment, open the airways. All right, good. The next one, a hypermetabolic state. You'll see this again in elimination, which I also teach. Hypermetabolism, what are you gonna see? Metabolic acidosis. And reason, think of hypermetabolic states. A patient who's febrile, what is, what is, what's happening in that? What's speeding up your, your hypermetabolic state? And so they might not be able to keep up with that metabolism piece, and so they become acidotic. Think of patients who have seizures. Think of patients who are hyperexertion, like military people or athletes. They're in a hypermetabolic state. So, exercise, fever, seizures. So, if they're acidotic, what are you going to do for this patient? Fluids, good. What else can you give them? Bicarb, an ampa bicarb. That helps, buffer. What did you say? I'm sorry. Electrolytes, maybe. But remember, when a patient is acidotic, which electrolyte is elevated? The big kahuna, the big K, potassium. With acidosis, you have hyperkalemia. Um, 
So you, electrolytes, you have to be mindful and watch that, okay? So if a patient, let's, let's keep going down this rabbit hole, if the patient is hyperkalemia, what can you give them to help lower that? Yeah. Hmm? <coughs> Insulin and what else? <coughs> Calcium gluconate, yeah, maybe. We'll talk more about that in um, D50. You're, 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 you're on the right. Hold that thought on calcium gluconate. I'm not going to go across this here, but you'll see it again in um, elimination. So D50 and insulin does what to potassium to lower it? Pushes it back into the cells. All right? So if you see an, see an extreme state like DKA or some diabetic ketoacidosis or something like that, that would be a treatment. So keep those concepts in the back of your mind, you're going to see it again. Metabolism lecture, elimination lecture, DKA, all right? All of it, all of it crosses paths and you're going to see it numerous times. This is taking care of patients in acute life-threatening situations because hyperkalemia impacts the heart, right? Yes. Mrs. Gerritsen? Indeed it does, Dr. B. I yep. mean, we're talking ventricular arrhythmias, too high or too low. Correct. Hyperkalemia, hypokalemia. Your cardiac, you don't have your ticker, that's it, game over. All right, high altitude. So this is something I learned when I worked in Colorado for a year and a half. What happens with high altitudes? What kind of alkalosis? Respiratory. Respiratory alkalosis because Denver, mile high, what is there less of? There's less oxygen. So the compensatory mechanism that humans kick in, they're breathing faster. So they're breathing off that CO2, okay? So they become alkalotic. So what can you do to help this patient? What, what, okay, I'm sorry, let me back up. Higher altitudes, less oxygen concentration, and say people at, you know, zero ground level in New Orleans goes to Denver. What is the other piece that we're missing, us um, swamp people? What are we missing? <laughs> what? <laughs> heme? Did somebody say heme? <laughs> Red blood cells? They say <laughs> You're right, because it's very dry in Denver. <laughs> but humidity doesn't do anything with that. It's the heme. We don't have enough red blood cells because the heme is the oxygen carrying capacity of O2. So there's two things, there's less oxygen, less heme. So a compensatory mechanism for someone that goes to high altitudes, their blood is thicker, the H and H is higher. They have more co concentrated red blood cells. So what are you gonna do for this patient? They're coming in, their metabolic alkalosis, they're breathing too, too much. What are you gonna do? Oxygen, yes. Um, maybe breathing treatment, possibly. Um, you can't really give them units of blood, it's just a comp compensation that happens over time. If they're too high altitude, like say they're in the mountains, you can bring them down to a lower altitude, that's helpful. So um, people who go skiing for the first time, that, that's what's called altitude sickness. And then they just can't stay, they have to come down. So anyway, it's a big thing for people, if any of y'all go move out there to uh, the mountains. There was another thought I had and it ran out my head. I'll come back to it. All right, so hypoxemia with Carbon dioxide loss is respiratory alkalosis, okay? All right, kidney failure. Metabolic acidosis, very good. Because remember pH, the hydrogen ions, hydrogen ion elimination is impaired. We're not gonna get down to that cell level for testing. Um, the other thing that kidneys produce is bicarb. You have several organs that produce bicarb, and kidneys are one of them. 
and when that's impaired, what is the other thing that kidneys produce? That's very important. What's that? Erythropoietin, and that also plays in two, as well as high altitudes, you don't have enough oxygen carrying capacity. So people who are on dialysis, they get erythropoietin injection, sub-Q, after every dialysis um, appointment to help bolster that red blood cell count. Yes, ma'am. Could I go back to the um, high altitude? Sure. Um, would they consider um, that chamber that... Um, yes, the um, hyperbaric chamber, yeah. possibly if it's severe enough. Okay. So hyperbarics, the principle behind it is it infuses oxygen-rich through diving. The oxygen, it's an oxygen-rich environment that helps tissues heal. It's kind of like uh, diving below, below water. So yes, that is a viable option. I'm not ask, I don't ask a question on high altitudes. It's more nice to know, but you're exactly right. Um, hyperbarics work. Hyperbarics, the main thing is it helps promote tissue healing. It, it, it's great. So if you ever have any wound, patients with wound issues, hyperbarics, they'll probably go into that. Autoimmune diseases, I had an aunt who had MS, and she would, went into the chamber like once or twice a week. Oh, this was 30 years ago, but even back then they were using hyperbarics. So. Good question. Thank you. Was that, did that answer your question? Yeah. Sometimes I go down rabbit holes and I'm like, what was the original thought? <laughs> yeah. Did you have Thank a question? You. No. Good. Um, so kidney failure. So. What else are you gonna see with kidney failure? I just sent, said it a little while ago. What electrolyte is elevated? Potassium. So D50 insulin, that works faster than the other one, um, sodium polystyrene. Paxily, have y'all heard of that? That can be given oral, rectal via enema, but that takes longer to work because it's going through the GI tract, all right? It's a good option. So, you know, but it's slower. And then kidney failure, you're gonna have um, hyperkalemia, um, dialyze them, send them to dialysis. You know, get that extra K out, get those, that extra volume out so they can, blood pressure can normalize. So we're gonna go into that in a lot more depth in elimination. All right. Early stage acute pulmonary problems. Remember, the respiratory, respiratory alkalosis. You probably learned this in ARDS. I think Mrs. Garrison was, you taught ARDS? <coughs> Ms. Dickerson had the first hour and I brought it home with the last two hours, but we did discuss ARDS. Stiff, wet lungs, um, refractory hypoxemia. So what happens at the beginning you're hyperventilating, so you're blowing off that CO2. That's right. So early stage, you'll have respiratory alkalosis. Then the patient hits a wall. The compens compensatory mechanisms are not working. Then they go into acidosis. That's when your O2s drop. Your your acid base, your your blood gases are are starting to get really bad. Then you probably have to intubate the patient and start protocol for ARDS treatment with me? So early stage versus late stage. Alkalosis first, then acidosis. All right. Head or neck trauma? Which one? Respiratory acidosis, because what happens with head trauma? Your airway is compromised, respiratory depression because of the injury, the trauma to the head. It could suppress the breathing, um, the breathing apparatus because of the head injury. There could be blood in the brain with swelling. Okay. So, what what can be done? What if they have a hematoma, epidural hematoma, and it's swelling? What What do you think? You're the ER nurse. Who are you going to call? Ghostbusters. <laughs> Get them ready for intubation, probably so, yes. But this patient needs surgery. 
and need to re release the pressure on the brain. So you as the ER nurse, you're working at a level one trauma center, it, it, you know, the residents flopping around and floundering and, hey dude, call the neurosurgery, they need to put a bolt in the head or a ventricular shunt or they need to go to the OR, okay? So uh, this is part of your advocacy for the patient, all right? So knowing what all, what's going on helps you with care. <clears throat> so respiratory depression, treat whatever's causing it. Neck, unstable, neck from a C-spine C injury. All right, next one, uh, dehydration. Metabolic acidosis. Metabolic acidosis. So what are you going to do for this patient? IV fluids. IV fluids. If they're acidotic, what might you give? Check the potassium. Take them out if they're dehydrated from overexertion in the heat. Take them out, you know, get them out of the sun. Okay? Inadequate chest expansion. Respiratory acidosis. Respiratory acidosis. Think COPD. Think your pediatric population with um, chest malformation, you know, barrel chest, pigeon, you know, excavatum, whatever they call it, I don't know. But yeah. this isn't a peds course, yeah. so I'm not asking peds. I think it's pectus excavatum. Yeah, thank you. I remember uh, that. Uh, it's when the, the chest kind of is, grows inward, it's weird. But this is adult, so I'm not gonna ask Pete's questions. Um, so, inadequate okay. chest expansion, COPD, what are you gonna do for this patient to correct that acidosis? What's that? Positioning, yeah, perfect, sit them up. Get, if they're laying down, you're compromising the area of the chest that's, that they're laying on. What else can you do for this patient? Breathing treatment, BiPAP, CPAP, BiPAP, CPAP chest PT, very good, very good. All right, you wanna promote oxygenation. Suction them if they have mucus plug. All right, inadequate chest expansion, they're on SIMV and they're acidotic what would you, what could you do to this vent settings? Oh, hyperventilate, rate. increase the rate. That's what I'm looking for. Gold star. <laughs> well done. All right. So inadequate chest expansion, you have acidosis, but mechanical ventilation. What might you see? Uh, respiratory alkalosis because they may be over breathing, they may have too much volume, they may have too much pressure, okay? So adjust the vent settings, all right? Get a blood gas, remember, trend your blood gases. I, I like to think of ICU, although I am not an ICU nurse, I hate dealing with the spaghetti and all the drips, that just blows my mind. It's a good way to describe it. But in, ICU mechanical ventilation, I forgot where I was going with that. I am not doing good this morning. You are, it's <laughs> very interesting. interesting. It is. If they're hyperventilating with CO2 loss, adjust the vent settings. Contact respiratory, ask the doctor. I, I've been over clumped this week. I had a man working on my house, a carpenter, it took me two years to find this guy. And I was at work, so he's like, well, what day do you want me to come? Thursday, Friday, I'll be home. So what days does he come? Tuesday and Wednesday, when I'm in clinical all day long. But it's probably for the best, because I'd have been freaking out if he's banging on my house, and I'm in the house. <laughs> so I'm all, I'm all verklempt. I, it doesn't take much to get me verklempt. Y'all know that word, verklempt, mm -hmm. out of sorts? It's a good word. That's yes, ma'am. The, the construction at East Jefferson, just ask my students, Jackhammer. I, I mean, I like drives me down. nuts. I'm like, it's over. That's your comic relief. Okay. I try to keep a little funny. How am I doing on time? Good. Okay. So mechanical ventilation, they're hyperventilating. They can also hypoventilate. So you got to watch for that. But more likely than not, it'll be hyperventilation with alkalosis. All right. Um, 
Liver failure. Ooh, horrible death. Respiratory acidosis. The patient's dying. Everything's dying. When everything dies, it becomes acidotic because of the lactate, lactic acid buildup. The death, I mean, the funky stuff. Liver failure is a horrible disease. Have y'all ever seen that? They turn jaundice, they're dead. It's bad. So God bless you, those of you going into medical ICU. That and neuro ICU. You, God bless you. Yes, ma'am. Which one you say was liver failure? Liver failure is, okay, is it metabolic or respiratory? Well, I'm just metabolic and acid up. Because everything's dying. You know, your livers, your kidneys regulate the whole, you know, metabolic processes. And if one of them goes, it's not good. Any, any questions? Y'all, did I say? You did say Westwood, though. I told y'all I'm need I need a couple of days off to. All right. Liver failure, metabolic acidosis. Okay. Liver also produces bicarb, so that's diminished. The buildup of lactic acid, we're going back to microbiology, biology, cellular um, metabolism. And then patients die. All right, airway obstruction. Oh, Respiratory. Acidosis. Okay, so what are some things that can obstruct the airway? <coughs> mucus. Mucus plug. What else? It's getting ready to turn cold. The humidity's going to drop more. What are you going to see in your patients increasing? Patients with a certain asthma. asthma. So those of you going in the ED, get your asthma kits ready because cold air, low humidity triggers asthma attacks. Wheezing, all right? So think about what you're gonna do for this patient who comes in status asthmaticus. What are you gonna do? Breathe in treatment. What's the drug of choice for patients with asthma? Uh, um, albuterol, yeah, but if this is not a breathing treatment drug. Hmm? This is not a breathing treatment I'm looking for. No, you're right. Prednisone. All your asthma patients are going to be on a steroid. Okay, yes, Duoneb's right. Yes, albuterol's right. They're going to get breathing treatments, but make sure they have a steroid order. Okay? All right, your patients who have uh, pulmonary embolism, PE, what could you as a nurse have done to prevent this airway obstruction? Make sure what's on your patients. STDs. 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 <laughs> <laughs> STDs. Yeah, I know that are going to keep it away, huh? Okay. <laughs> Uh, slip of the tongue, but FYI, they don't call them STDs anymore. STIs. 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 STIS.
Um, infection, pneumonia is common, pneumonia season. So remember, there's two kinds of pneumonia, bacterial and viral. You can't give them antibiotics if it's viral. Get a chest x-ray and you'll see that classic whiteout, that one lobe, it's all white. It's amazing. I was an NP before. It was like a plan B for my career, but I love teaching so much and I love you guys, so I stay teaching. Mm -hmm. But it was such a huge learning opportunity. If you want to go to NP school, I highly recommend it. You're practicing medicine. But it was cool because we have pneumonia patients coming in November, December, everybody's getting sick, flu, pneumonia. You take the chest x-ray and you see that if it's bacterial, you see that complete white out of the lobe. It's, it's, it's stunning. All right, enough of that. Drugs, especially opioids. Respiratory acidosis, you have, they have suppressed respirations. If it's okay, I got two scenarios for you. Opioid overdose, what are you gonna give them? Naloxone. Naloxone, Narcan. Naloxone. And they wake up and they're like, what? And they're like, what did you do? But then think of the other, this other thing, respiratory depression due to opioids immediate post-op. This is for all you PACU nurses. Are you gonna give them naloxone? No. Because you, you're not gonna give them naloxone because you don't want to wreck their post-op pain control. So do other stuff. What else other stuff can you do? Uh, they, they may need to be put on a vent if it's bad enough, but you want to assist with ventilation, correct. So what are you going to do for that? If they're still obtunded, chin thrust, head, head back, chin thrust, open up the airway. If they're more so getting more weight, sit them up. What else can you do? Oxygen, what else can you do? Stimulate them. For God's sakes, don't do this. That is so painful. The, the sternal rub. Don't do that. That's so antiquated. And if you see someone, tell them, don't do that. You see someone doing that. One of those residents think they're all hot stuff. Don't do that. Pinch the ear. Pinch here. This is painful. Okay? Stimulate them. Hey, how you doing? Wake up. Come on, it's time to wake up. You might need to do that for several minutes. Um, help, them, help them get to where they're oxygenating. And it'll wear off eventually. Opioids take a little longer. Propofol, they'll wake right up. All right. They have respiratory depression, so you want to reverse that. Antacids, Tom's. Alpha seltzer, MOM is metabolic alkalosis. What are the antacids doing in the GI tract? It's neutralizing the stomach pH. Stomach pH two to five. What's neutral pH? Seven. Seven point oh. The range for pH is zero to fourteen. So if they're getting all these. Antacids, they're getting the upwards neutral to alkalotic. MOM is milk of magnesia. Malox, increased bases through oral ingestion. So if anybody goes and works in GI, for a patient who has, um, say, a stomach ulcer, can they live on antacids for the rest of their lives? No. You have to treat the cause. Go refer the patient to gastroenterologist. It could be an H. pylori ulcer. And if it's the bacteria type of ulcer, they have to go through a six-week course of treatment with lots and lots of drugs to heal it. Or they may have to have surgery if the ulcer barrels through the stomach. All right? So they're... they're there is a way to stop the progression of that. They can't take that stuff for the rest of their lives. All right. DKA, we talked about that already. What is it? Metabolic acidosis. Metabolic acidosis. Okay. So what it is exactly, diabetic ketoacidosis, God bless you, which happens with patients with type 
what diabetes? Type 1 diabetes. Their metabolic processes are so messed up, they're starting to metabolize fatty acids. It's fatty acid oxidation leading to these ginormous leaps in, in, in glucose, 700, 800. So when you have a patient that's sick, the patients can die from that. What can you do for that DKA patient? Insulin D50. What else? Fluids. Fluids. Yep. Yeah. Fluids. What else? TPN. Maybe. Maybe. Good point. Because patients who have DKA, their stomach stops working. And what is that called? Does anybody know? Gastroparesis. You get the other gold star. Well done. Gastroparesis. You really can't. They won't eat because they can't process food with DKA. So once that sugar starts coming down, you're gonna probably do Q6, Accutrex, giving them D50 insulin, TPN if it's been a few days, until that acidosis corrects itself, the sugar comes down and the patient says, I'm hungry, can I eat something? <gasps> Yay, this is what we want. Mm -hmm. Yes? You keep saying give them D50 insulin. For D50? A high, D50, they have a high blood sugar and you're going to give them D50 still? Because you're going to give, it, it sounds counterintuitive. Yeah. I that's, promise you it works. I, be, I believe you, but I'm not. Because <laughs> when you have the high sugar, what else is also going to be high with the acidosis? What electrolyte? Oh, your potassium. Potassium. So you're going to monitor that as well. I forgot to say that. Thank you. D50, insulin. D50 pushes potassium in cells, and the combination of the D50 and the insulin lowers. Okay. I promise you it works. I think the D50 is more so with the potassium. Yeah. And it sounds counterintuitive, but it works. Okay. Yeah. Have you, are you an ICU or med surge? I'm in med surge now. I, I'm hoping you might get to see that in med surge. You would also, yes ma'am. Dr. D, Chris has been a paramedic for how many years? 25-ish. Okay. It sounds counterintuitive. It works. Okay. I don't have a better explanation for you. Uh, but I think, um, and you can look it up and send me a correction. I think the D50 helps with the potassium and the insulin with the sugar. Right. But both of them work together. Okay. And it's not the D50 Brister Jets. You can draw up D50 from, an amp from a vial, like a 25, mm -hmm. 50 cc vial. All right, DKA, you're gonna hear that. You're gonna be so sick of DKA by the end of the semester. Fatty acid oxidation, gastroparesis. Alcohol intoxication. Not respiratory. Metabolic acidosis. ETOH is the chemical symbol for alcohol. Ethylene oxide hydrogen. You're, Dumping a bunch of hydrogen ions in, remember that'll affect the pH. They're not eating. They become acidotic. So what can you do for this patient? Fluids. 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 More so, what kind of fluids? What are you gonna add to the fluids? What is it? Vitamins, thiamine. Because what happens, patients who drink alcohol, they're not eating properly. And so they have a reduction in intake of water-soluble vitamins. And what are your two main water-soluble vitamins? You might see this on boards. Bs and what else? Bs and C, vitamin C, vitamin Bs are water-soluble. So you don't have a way to hold on to those vitamins in your body. All right, D, E, and K, those are in your fat. fat. Those are fat soluble, you have stores of that. There's one caveat about the B vitamins though, especially thiamine. What, does the, what do those B vitamins help with? Think of a patient who is alcohol withdrawal and they have the DTs. B vitamins, thiamine helps with neurological transmission. So that will help 
reduce the delirium tremens that patients get withdrawing from alcohol, all right? Yes? Are you giving these patients like a banana bag or are you yes. adding those? Yes, a banana bag vitamin? has multivitamin, mm -hmm. which turns it yellow, the thiamine, riboflavin, mm -hmm. several B vitamins in addition to that. That helps, and then there's um, a benzodiazepine that these patients get for the psychosis. Usually it's, um, I can't remember the generic, but the drug is lithium. No, Librium, yes. not lithium. Lithium. Yes. Don't, don't write that down. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You worked at a jail, yes. Um, and we used to give, um, Who's giving Ativan for the? Ativan works too. Um, Lorazepam. Well, we used to give Librium if it was really bad. Librium is also in the same family as Lorazepam. I can't remember the generic for it, but Librium I think works better for that alcohol withdrawal. Ativan works too. But go ahead. Well, we used to give uh, Transine. Transine, a psych drug. I'm not going to test on that, but I don't know the generic either. Did you learn that in psych, mental health? No. Transine, T-R-A-N-X-E-N-E? Don't worry about writing that down. It's, but that is it's probably a cheaper drug, I guess. It's probably why they used to work, use it in the prison. So it's generic. Okay, Librium chlordiazepoxide, the generic. I'm not going to ask you a question on Librium. It's more nice to know. But thank you for looking that up. I appreciate it. You know, I ask students, hey, look that up real quick. So thank you. I appreciate it. How am I doing with time? Am I getting 9.14. Okay. So alcohol intoxication, you know, Mardi Gras, everybody's drunk. And, you know, New Orleans gets 24-7 access to alcohol. You know, alcohol, intoxication. The other thing you're going to see is pancreatitis. Oh, my God. We'll talk about that in a minute. Prolonged vomiting and nasogastric suctioning. Are those two on your list? Mm -hmm. what, those are the same. What is it? You're pulling off the stomach acid. All right? The pH increases. You have an acid deficit. So with the NG tube suctioning, if it's on continuous, what can you, hey doc, can we get it more intermittent, maybe, you know? <coughs> God bless you. Uh, prolonged vomiting on Dancitron. If that doesn't work, promethazine, Finnegan. There's other um, drugs that work. I can't think of them off the top of my head. But the problem with promethazine one, you can't give it IV in a peripheral because you're gonna tear up the veins in the arm and they're gonna get necrotic. And two, you can't give it more than three or four days because then they'll go into TD, tardive dyskinesia, TK, because they get the tremors, the all that mental health stuff, all that mental health farm stuff. It all comes together. So watch your patients. Thorazine, promethazine, they can, that's just a short term Med. All right, salicylate intoxication, metabolic acidosis, aspirin, acetyl salicylic acid. You're putting acid in the patient, or the patient's doing it to themselves. You get a bottle of bear and uh, glug, 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 glug. They show up at the ED, you probably have to put charcoal in their stomach, neutralize that acid. Pancreatitis, metabolic acidosis, alcoholism. Remember the pancreas has two functions. The endogenous function, which is what? It releases what? Insulin, other types of hormones. And the exogenous function, which releases what? Stomach enzymes to break down food. So the, it's the exogenous function that goes into hyperdrive and the pancreas catabolizes itself. Acute pancreatitis could come from um, alcohol, excessive alcohol intake, 
could also come from gallbladder, gallstones, blocking the pancreatic ducts. All of that's all up in here. And if one little stone gets an end, blocks everything up, it can make it a mess. So, all right, what do you get, what do you do for a patient with acute pancreatitis? NPO, because you do not want to stimulate that exogenous function that enzymes are just eating up the pancreas. It's like the pancreas is catabolizing itself. So TPN, fluids, bicarb, don't feed them anything by mouth. If it's gallbladder induced, surgery has to come and get a cholecystectomy. All right, God bless you. Acute pancreatitis is serious. They can't drink anymore, right? Mm -hmm. So what are you going to do to support the patient? Yeah, AA, Alcoholics Anonymous. Nobody can afford rehab. Mm -hmm. 50 grand down the toilet, but I'm going to relapse. Mm -hmm. AA is proven. It's not perfect, but people, people do swear by it. Once the patient gets better, oh, the other thing too, that pancreatitis, they'll get opioids, morphine, because morphine rela relaxes that sphincter that releases all that. So morphine is the preferred pain because these patients are in a lot of pain. I know, when I was a charity, I was on the fifth floor med surge and every patient on that ward, there were 10 patients on the ward, <laughs> practically every one of them had acute pancreatitis because they drank too much. I, I saw that in my entire second level med, med surgery patient. All right, so these patients can get very sick. You may see them in the ICU. <clears throat> Diarrhea. Metabolic acidosis. Metabolic acidosis. When it comes out the top, nausea and vomiting, it's alkalosis because you're losing stomach pH. When it comes out the bottom, it's acidosis because you're dehydrated, okay? So give them whatever they need to help correct that diarrhea. Obesity, plaster casts for children, inadequate chest expansion, what would you expect to see? Respiratory acidosis, all right? Shock and um, Dr. Yuta is going to go over this in your infection le lecture. What are you going to see? Respiratory. You're going to start off with respiratory alkalosis because at early stages of shock, sepsis, the comp compensatory mechanism, and then they go into acidosis. And so Dr. Yuta will go down that path. And TPN, what might you see with TPN? <clears throat> metabolic what? Alkalosis. Correct. Re metabolic alkalosis because you have a lot of buffers in TPN and that could make the patient alkalotic. One minute over. Was this helpful? Yes. You can see a lot of the nursing interventions, nursing actions cross over. IV fluids, bicarb, D50 insulin. Take a break. Come back 931, 932.